Well, welcome to uh, our uh, equipping hour this morning. It is great to see all of your faces. Uh, it's uh, just, uh, just a joy to be with you this morning on the Lord's Day to be able to worship with God's people, be able to hear the word. Um, let me uh, go to the Lord just as we open our time and just uh, ask for uh, his help and his presence here this morning. God, we uh, thank you that we can come together as your people to gather around your word, to gather for the sake of worship. Uh, pray that we would be worshipers at our heart as we uh, listen to your word, as we sing this morning, as we uh, interact and fellowship with each other, uh, that our uh, conversations would be marked by just a, a gospel-fueled joy, a joy that we have in Christ. So just thank you that you have united us uh, into your family through our uh, one faith, our common faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it is in his name we pray. Amen. All right, well, we are going to be uh, taking a quick break. Smed was doing a series on evangelism. He's going to pick that up in a couple weeks, but uh, I get to be with you for the next few weeks to do uh, just a short study on Proverbs 31. Uh, really, the, the Proverbs 31 woman, the God-fearing woman. Uh, and such a, such a great passage that I think we just need to keep in front of us often uh, for not just for young ladies, not just for married women, uh, but for, for the church to look at. This is a picture of godliness, uh, what a godly woman looks like. Uh, a few weeks ago, we were having uh, dinner with a, a couple from church. It was at our house, and we were having a conversation around the dinner table, and our, uh, our daughter was, was asked the question if she, if she wants to get married and how she's thinking about marriage. And uh, I just love the conversation because we got to talk about, you know, what are the things that you should look for in a spouse someday? You know, in, the, in this conversation, the couple we were sitting with got to ask the wife, uh, what are the things that you looked for in a spouse? What are the things that attracted you to, to this man? And uh, I just love that conversation. As, as often as we can have that conversation in the home as our, as our daughter is growing up, I just love to put in front of her, you know, what does it look like to, to go after the characteristics of a godly man? Uh, but here this morning, we're going to look at a different angle. This is not uh, the characteristics of a, of a husband, but actually uh, the characteristics of what, you could say, what to look for in a spouse. In the, uh, if you look back, the, the original audience here of this proverb is actually a, a young man and his mother instructing him, here is what you should look for in a spouse. This is what you should go after as you think about finding a, a godly spouse. So uh, let's turn to, to Proverbs 31, and we're going to work through over the next couple of weeks this passage together. I'll look at uh, half of it this morning, and then we'll, we'll look at the other, the other half next week. But turn to Proverbs 31, and uh, just look at actually, uh, we'll, we'll be in this section, verse 10 through 31, but look at verse 1 just to introduce uh, this chapter. You have uh, here the words of King Lemuel the oracle which his mother taught him. So you have here the, the instructions of a mother to a son in the first uh, nine verses, instructing him what it looks like to be a, a faithful man and really a, a faithful king. He's going to be king, you see, uh, in this section. But then as you get to verse 10, here's what it looks like to find uh, this, this all-important quest to find a, a wife, a godly wife. So this is her instruction to him on this path. And... Uh, just so helpful to, for us to, to think about this in context. You know, the, the original audience of this was not the, uh, the women's ministry. It was actually the, uh, the young men, uh, you know, the young men. And, and, and obviously, uh, by implication, this is what the, the women should be going after, the kind of characteristic of godliness. But just to, to put that in front of us, to remind us that this is not, not just a passage to say, go after this if you are a married woman, and that's, that's the only thing this is for. But this is actually a, a passage for the whole church, for all of God's people, for the, the husbands to be able to say, this is the, the characteristics I should encourage in my wife, for the fathers and mothers to say, these are the things that we want our daughters to go after. These are the kind of things we want our sons to, to value. Uh, for the, obviously, for the women in the church, both the single and the married women, to say, these are the characteristics of godliness. So such a, such a helpful passage for us. And just as we think about just Proverbs, the way that the, the Proverbs function, uh, these, uh, these truisms, you could say that, that Proverbs is uh, maybe the, the picture book of the Bible. Uh, it actually gives us uh, word pictures. It gives us uh, all of these truths, but, but shown to us 
uh, through different situations, through, through pictures, through stories. And here, obviously, Proverbs 31 is no exception to that. You have a, a picture for us of a, of a godly woman looking at her life, looking at her, her daily life, looking at the, the picture of her life. Uh, and, and just to, at the outset, I think it's helpful just to, to realize that this is the, the picture of a, of a holistic life of a, of a woman who, has, as you see, has raised children, children that rise up and call her blessed uh, at the, you know, nearing the end of her life. So sometimes we can, we can make the mistake, I think, for, even for young men to look at this and to say, okay, I want to I find the woman that's already arrived at this, you know, that's already raised kids and they have a, maybe a, an unhealthy standard of what they're expecting, but, but for us to just to peel away and say, what are, the, what are the virtues behind all of the activities? What are the, the principles that the, the author is driving us at to see what's the, the characteristic of godliness here? And uh, if you didn't know this, that this, this actually poem is written uh, as an acrostic. So every, uh, every verse is a letter in the, the Hebrew alphabet, 22 verses, 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And uh, really that's to help the Hebrew audience to be able to memorize, that they could call this to mind, you know, as a, as a tool for their instruction to keep in front of the, the young men and young women as they're growing up in Hebrew society. So again, I want to take this, this passage back from, from just saying, okay, this is what uh, the, the women's ministry should go after. Yes, that is true, but this is what uh, the church should go after for, for the women, the young women, to instruct the young men in these same things, that this is what you should look for in a spouse. And as you think about just the, the life of this woman, I like to think of this like uh, if you have an iPhone uh, and you, you, you go on vacation and you come back from a trip, you've taken pictures, and what, what the iPhone does for you, sorry if you're an Android user, you have the, the green text bubble, but, but the, the iPhone, it gives you, a, here's, the, here's what the, the highlight reel of your trip. You know, it, has the, it puts it to music, it shows you a highlight reel. I like to think about this passage as kind of a, a highlight reel Let's look at the, the life of this woman, kind of like over the course of time, not a day in her life, but just over seasons of time, just the, the highlights. What are the, the big picture events in her life? And again, trying to press in, not on the necessarily just the external activities, but what are the, the principles? What are the things that drive this woman? And we have to remember this is written in a, in a different context, a different place, 3,000 years ago, agrarian society, you know, a little more like Little House on the Prairie than, uh, than our society, where you see this woman who is, uh, she's sewing, she's, uh, she's going out and getting wool from sheep, uh, she's doing, uh, sewing her own clothes. So a, a different, different lifestyle. So the goal is to say, how do I do all of these things that we in our culture are, are not going to do, but how do I have the same virtues that this woman has? How do I go after these same characteristics? You know, to have the, the same heart disposition, you know, to ask the question, what drives all of these activities? What is the, the motivation for her as she pursues all these things? And, and just, to, just to put in front of us, actually, the, the last verse, Proverbs 31, verse 31, and, and to say this, this is not about a, a position in life. It's not about being married or unmarried. It's not about there's some, there's some more moral virtue in, in even having children and having a spouse. But look at what she is known for. As you get to the end of this chapter, it says, give her the product of her hands, verse 31, and let her works praise her in the gates. So she is known by her works, by her activities, by her deeds. So she, she is known by the, the choices that she makes, how she lived her life. You could say, was she faithful? That's the goal, to live a, a faithful life, to be known by the, the actions uh, that you do, to, to look at someone's life and say they were faithful because of their choices, because of the way that they lived. And, uh, you know, in a, in a culture that we live in that's so confused about masculinity, about femininity, uh, this passage is just so helpful for us to remind ourselves again, these are the things that, that please the Lord. This is a, a life of faithfulness before God. You know, the, the overarching characteristic of her life, verse 30 this is a woman who fears the Lord. If you're going to summarize her life, what is she known by? She is known by her fear of the Lord, that she, she lives her life before God. She recognizes that God is the, the creator, that God is the king, that God is the judge, and that God is a, a savior. He is a saving God. 
and she has submitted her life under the authority of the Lord. In a culture around us that, that wants to, to find fulfillment in, uh, in a life of selfish pursuits, you know, telling women, you do you, go after this autonomous life, this independence, you know, find fulfillment on your own. You, you look down at this, this passage and remind ourselves, this is what pleases the Lord. You know, not what you see on social media, a life of fulfillment is not going to be found. You look at social media and you see all these things, all of the, the stuff, the purchases, the vacations, the fun, uh, you know, sports and activities and all this entertainment, and that's where fulfillment is found. And you, you look down on the pages here and you see a different kind of fulfillment. Fulfillment found in a life uh, submitted in service to the Lord. Uh, hard work, uh, joyful service. So at, on the outset, I think it's just helpful for us just to remind ourselves that this, this is what pleases the Lord, this kind of lifestyle, this kind of a characteristic for the, the women in here to be convinced, I want to go after a life that's pleasing to the Lord. That is where fulfillment is found, true fulfillment, you know, in the Lord's service as one who has been uh, blood-bought by the blood of Christ now is able to actually have joy in this life. Uh, her greatest desire here is to please the Lord. So we're going to look at the, the characteristics here, the, the lifestyle, the attitudes of this woman who fears the Lord. Look at verse 10, just uh, as it introduces this woman with a question. Again, the, the words of King Lemuel from his mother, you know, telling him, this is what you should look for in a, in a spouse. In verse 10, an excellent wife who can find. You know, not to say that she is uh, unattainable, but to say that it is rare her worth is far above jewels, you know, the most priceless jewels, the diamonds. It is hard to find this kind of woman. Uh, she is priceless. You don't see this every day. And her worth, it says, is far above jewels. And, and her worth here, not just to her husband, but I think her worth in the sight of the Lord. You know, as you look, this is a scripture. Not just to say these are, are qualities that you should find in a wife. But for women to say these are qualities that, that please the Lord, that are pleasing in the sight of God, you know, that a husband should value, obviously, but these are things that the Lord values. Uh, 1 Peter 3, 4, just, just listen to this. I think it's helpful at the outset just to think about uh, such a great passage when it thinks about just talking about a, a virtuous woman. I think, you know, you could summarize Proverbs 31 with 1 Peter 3, 4 says, the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. You know, in God's eyes, this kind of character that we're going to see is precious to the Lord. So we're going to look at just uh, the characteristics of her life. And here in verse 11 and 12 gives us uh, really a summary of her life. And you think about this, this proverb is, uh, you could call it a, a, a chiasm where there's a, a structure that's building. You have bookends on either side, and you have it going toward a, an inflection point in the middle. The inflection point really being in verse 23. Her husband is known in the gates. And on the, the bookends on each of these, you see that her, her husband, his heart, verse 11, trusts in her. And you get back to the end in, in verse 28 and following. Uh, her husband rises up and calls her blessed. So you see uh, verse 11 and 12 as is, is really an introduction a summary, verse 28 and following, is uh, also the, the summary statement of her life. And then what, what is in between is here's what her life looks like. Here's what day-to-day -day, uh, her service looks like, her work ethic, what it looks like as she pursues uh, household responsibilities, as she serves others. So we're going to look at, at these characteristics. But first, the verse 11 and 12, what's on display, the overarching theme of her life is faithfulness faithfulness. She is faithful. Look what it says, verse 11, the heart of her husband trusts in her. The heart of her husband. The, there is a, a bond of trust between her, her and her husband, and not just a, a statement. He's not just saying, yes, I trust you. It's saying his heart, you know, the, the center of his uh, affections and thoughts and feelings. Uh, the center of of him, you know, what, what he does just by, uh, that, that is actually his reflex, his impulse is to trust her. 
You know, he's not having to work hard to trust her. She has earned his trust. She has gained his trust. He automatically trusts her as he reacts to different things. He knows that she is trustworthy. So you just think about what would it look like to have the in-the-heart trust of a husband, of anyone. You know, to have that kind of trust, you would have had to demonstrate a life of faithfulness. You would have to, to handle your responsibilities well. You would have to, to have integrity over and over again, you'd have to see this. Her husband has had to see her be integrous, you know, thousands of times to be able to say, I, I completely trust you. My impulse is to trust you. Over and over again, she has followed through. He knows how she's going to respond in difficult situations. He's confident in how she's going to parent when he's away. He's confident in what she will do when no one is looking. You know, he's confident, he's not worried about what is she doing on her phone? What is she doing with her free time? What is she doing when she's with her friends? There is a a faithfulness that she demonstrates that that now causes him to implicitly trust her. And just just to back up for us, to think about this isn't whether you're married or not married, just consider what would it look like for your closest relationships to trust you this way? Obviously, a husband trusts her, the, the closest relationship. But you could think about what, what's it look like to have this kind of faithfulness for anyone to trust you this way? For your friends, the ones that know you the best, to have a heart that trusts you. You know, she, she clearly, she's not dropping the ball. She's consistent in her life. Uh, she's supportive. You, you can think about a transparency that's in view. She has to be transparent. They have to share their burdens together. She, he has to know what's going on in her life. There's a, a sharing of life. You know, this has taken work. It's not a fluid thing, this kind of trust. Active, ongoing. And you just think about how faithfulness would lead to this kind of trust. Talk about the, just the biblical idea of being faithful in little, to be faithful in much, to be faithful in more. And what, what you're saying in that statement, you talk, tell your kids, you know, be faithful in little things and you can be entrusted in greater things. Because you're saying you have demonstrated that you're trustworthy. You have demonstrated faithfulness. I have a confidence that I can give you more responsibility because you've been faithful in those things. So that's what, what's on display here is her faithfulness. And here, this is the, the greatest gift that a husband can have. It says he will have no lack of gain. No lack of gain. There, you could say on one hand, there's nothing greater than this. Maybe the, the greatest gift, the greatest earthly gift you could have is a kind of marriage where a husband and wife trust each other. The greatest gift that God could give to to a marriage is this kind of relationship. To have the the support of a spouse, you know, for for wives to consider that the greatest gift you can give your husband is your affection, your respect, your support, your trust, your, your devoted love. In verse 12, it says, she does him good, not evil, all the days of her life. Her focus is doing good to her husband, being an encouragement, being a helper as God intended, right, in the garden. God says, I will make a suitable helper for you. You know, someone to come alongside, to strengthen you, to support you, to help you. She has embraced this call. They have together embraced this call to say, we're going to go after the Lord's purposes together. And this is so countercultural. Verse 12, I think, is so countercultural to say that a, a wife would do him good would be concerned about about doing her husband good all the days of her life. Because we live in a culture that asks the question so often, what about me? What's in it for me? What do I get out of this? Right? That's what the the world around us asks. That's what they scream for is, what about me? And here you have a, a wife that is saying, how do I benefit him? Not going after selfish pursuits, but how do I be an encouragement? How do I be a support? How do we together go after what, what is best in the Lord's eyes. So this is a, a faithful woman. Faithful here, verse 11 and 12. And we're going to see, we're going to look at, I've just structured this, this passage high level. It's just, just three realms here in verse, uh, verses 13 through 22, verses 13 through 23. Just the, the realms of faithfulness. What are the, the realms of faithfulness that we, that we see here in these, in these first several verses? We're going to see a faithfulness over her work, the things that she does with her hands. We're going to see faithfulness over her, her resources, her responsibilities. We're going to see a faithfulness in her relationships. 
And just, I was talking to someone this week just about, uh, just about structuring passages, putting an outline together. And, uh, you know, the, the outline that, that I have for you is really trying to summarize, to synthesize, here's what's going on. Here's the structure of this passage, just to help, to help us to, to hang our thoughts on, to say, okay, these are the, the themes that are, being, that are in view here. So here, the, the first one, her work, just this realm of faithfulness, to think about what does she do during the day? What does her work look like? And again, remember that we're looking at the, the truisms here. Proverbs showing us this picture, but trying to get to the heartbeat. What drives these things? What are the, the characteristics on display in her work? What is the, the godly attitude that, that comes out of her as she works? Because that's what's going what's to transcend culture, what's going to transcend time, right? Is the, the character, the, the godliness here. And this is what we should go after, that the, the women in this room should go after this kind of godliness. So first we'll look at, look at just the, what is the, the verses, what, are they, what do they show? You know, what's the actual situation? And, and, then, and then talk about what's the, the characteristics, what's the, the heart behind these activities? So verse 13, as you're, as you're watching this woman, again, think about this highlight reel of her life. The, the first thing, one of the first things that comes into view throughout this, this chapter again and again is actually her hands. Verse 13, she, she looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. The hands coming up over and over again to signify her work. She is active. She is laboring with her hands. She's not, she's not sitting idly. She works hard. She is industrious. She is diligent. If you were to watch her for a day, you would see that she's always moving. She is not lazy. And here, verse 13, it says, she looks for wool and flask. Uh, this word looks for, that is to, to seek, to go out, to proactively find wool and flax. Uh, wool, obviously from sheep, to, to be able to make clothes. Flax was a, was a plant, a seed used for dyeing linens. So here, and you're going to see throughout this passage that she is making clothes. She is dyeing clothes. She is preparing clothes for her family, preparing clothes to sell. So that's part of her labor. But, but notice where this starts is that she is seeking this. You see the, the diligence on display to, to go after, to get the materials. I have to go find the wool. I have to go shear the sheep. I have to go, you know, find the flax seed to, to make the linen. So she is gathering material. She takes initiative I mean, you know this, you can see this in the workplace, the people that, that take initiative versus the people that are just waiting to be told what to do. You know, the people that are just waiting for five o'clock to hit, okay, now I can get out of here. Versus the ones that are saying, okay, what, what else can I do today? What other work can I take on? I mean, she is the one who is taking initiative, right? She's not just waiting for things to happen. She, she is going after them and, and doing them. And this is hard labor that's in view. You know, there's no, no Walmart, no Costco, no DoorDash, you can't get stuff delivered to your house. Right? She, is, uh, she is working hard. I, I overheard uh, someone having a conversation with Zach Can, a missionary in Papua New Guinea, and they asked him, do they, do they have Amazon over there? And uh, you know, he kind of laughed and was like, didn't know if they were serious or not. And, uh, just, but just talked about you know, the, the nature of just labor in that kind of third world environment. You know, as, you, as you hear uh, Jeremy and Lori talk about just, just daily life, uh, just all of the work, just to make food. I mean, that, what I'm always blown away with is, man, there's just so much work just to survive. And here, you, you look at this woman's life, and this is hard work, uh, labor. Everything is hard here. No, no washing machine. She's making her own clothes, making her own food, all of this labor. But, but notice what, what, what accompanies this labor. You know, you watch her, like I said, watch her for a day, and you see her working. You see her hands moving, but you, you also notice how she does this work. Not downcast, not upset, but she does it in delight, it says. She enjoys this kind of hard labor. She does it eagerly, joyfully, uh, without complaint. You know, this, this hard labor, hard tasks. And I'm sure we could all think about just the different jobs that we have, uh, different, different home tasks, different things that there are different things, I know, like, like laundry or, or whatever it might be that you could just say, man, that's just hard work. That is grueling labor. You know, the thing I, I least like to do. But here, she does all of it with delight. 
she does it uh, again under this banner of fear of the Lord. What does it look like to be a God-fearer in your work? It looks like doing your work with delight, doing it under the banner of serving the Lord. You know, she's not doing this uh, as, a, as a burden, not, not through some kind of guilt or external burden. I have to do this for this person or I, I feel guilty. I just want to stay busy. You know, she's demonstrating just a, a clean conscience, an enjoyment of life, an enjoyment of service of the Lord. She takes pleasure in it. And just to consider that every, every task that we have in front of us, everything that we do, whether we enjoy it in the moment or not, is an opportunity to, to serve the Lord, to worship the Lord. All of the things that we have. I remember uh, early on when we started coming to the, to the church here, and Smed was preaching, and he, he made a statement, just like in passing, I think, about, about work, God giving work before the curse before Genesis 3. And I remember uh, just having a job that I didn't enjoy and just and, and hearing him say that, it's like, really, is that right? You know, this job that I, that, I, that I can't stand, that there's actually a gift, work is a gift that God gave to man, that we could actually enjoy work. Obviously, sin, you know, makes a mess of work. It, work is hard because of, because of people, right? Because there's sinful people, because we sin. But, but work in itself is a gift from God. I mean, this woman sees this as a gift to, to eagerly embrace the gift of work, to be able to, to serve the Lord as she works, as she is faithful in her work. So you see that just the diligence, the initiative, industriousness on display. Verse 14, it says, She is like merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. So now a picture of, a, of merchant ships, trading ships. Ships that are coming with different goods and resources. As you read even in the book of 1 Kings, you think about Solomon. It talks about merchant ships coming with, with even exotic animals from faraway places that Solomon would, would purchase. And so you have this picture of these faraway ships coming for a, a long journey, uh, working hard to get to a destination, you know, storms along the way, but all for this, this goal of, of obviously trading this goal of uh, we're going to trade our goods for a, for a profit. But here, I think the, the heartbeat, what's on display for her again is this, this industriousness, this work ethic, like a merchant ship going to great lengths to sell its goods. You know, she doesn't slack off. She's not a quitter. She, she works all the way. She, she does her work t- till it's done. You know, she's not a, not a quitter. She follows through. Uh, she's committed to finishing her task, regardless of how hard it is. She works ha- hard all the time, you know, not phased by what's in front of her. The, you just see here over and over again this picture of this woman. There's no, no laziness. She is battling against a, a lazy heart. She is battling for a just joyful service. Whatever task she has in front of her, whatever mountain of work, she goes after it with zeal. And I think you can, you can tell pretty quick your work, work ethic, how you're viewing your work when you're handed a, a big task. Think about at work, in the home, when there's just a, a big task, a boss puts on your desk, here's all these things that you have to do. You know, a, a new assignment. Or, or just a, a home project, something that's going to take weeks and weeks. You know, something you can't finish in an afternoon. You can tell pretty quick, what's my disposition toward work when I, when I have those things? Am I eagerly embracing those? Am I, am, I, am I starting to say, okay, how do I get this done with a joyful heart? Or do you look at those as this overwhelming mountain of work? You know, start to complain in your heart. Well, here she has this mountain of work and she embraces it. This merchant ships. She, she does all of the work. She eagerly gets after it. In verse 15, still in, the, in this realm of, of her work, it says, She rises also while it is still night. She gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. So here she is uh, rising while it's still night, that is to say before the sun rises. So she's getting up early. She's starting her day early to, to get after it, to start working. And she's preparing for others. She's preparing food for the, the maidens. These are the, the household workers. You get the picture here in this, in this proverb. This woman, they have a, an estate here. There are other, other people on this estate, in this household. And she is actually delegating duties, preparing food for them, making sure they're taken care of. And, and when it says that, 
that she gives portions to her maidens. That word portions is, is not just food, I think, in view. It's actually, that word is to say there are assigned tasks. There's an instruction that she's giving. So she's giving them the, the tools that they need, and she's giving them the instruction that they need. So she's preparing for her day. She's preparing others for their day. So you see this picture of, of this woman that is just carefully managing all the things in front of her, uh, carefully managing the, the others that have responsibility, delegating responsibility. You know, to say this woman, okay, you're responsible for the, the sheep and you're responsible for the food and I'm going to help you. I'm going to give you the resources and I'm going to support you. I mean, this is the picture of this woman. So she's able to assess the situation. She's able to understand all of the work that's required. And if you've ever uh, managed someone in the workplace, I was talking to a, a friend last week who was talking about having a, a new employee that, that he was having to manage. And, and as he was talking about it, he just said, oh man, I, tomorrow I have to do so much more work because I'm going to be gone for a day, so I have to list out all of his tasks. In addition to doing my own work, I have to tell him all the things he has to do. And uh, the same with, with parenting. You want to help your kids learn how to clean their room or do dishes, right? It's easier to just do it yourself. But at some point to say, I want to I help them do it, you have to work harder. You have to, to be patient. You have to teach and instruct. You have to give them responsibility and, and, and watch them. So here, she is giving responsibility to others. Just an extra level of work here, an extra level of planning, an extra level of diligence. She's not just, uh, just busy. You know, we, we have a culture where busyness sometimes equals godliness. As long as we're busy, then we're being faithful. No, she's actually taking the time to plan, to assess. And I'm not saying that, that godliness is making sure you have a, a day planner. And not to say that godliness is you have to get up at 5.30 before the sun rises, but again, to look at what's, the, what's behind the scenes here, what's going on in her life. You know, what's the, in the proverb here? What are, we, what are we trying to get after? Well, I think it's a life of discipline. She is self-disciplined. She gets up early. She plans. You know, it takes a lot more work to plan your day than to just start your day. You know, to actually spend the time to say, what are the things that, are, that I have to prioritize today? To start to rank priorities to start to, to assess the situation. That's what she's doing. She's, she's putting in the extra work to make sure that she prioritizes her time well, to make sure that she, she handles her responsibilities well. So this is a, a disciplined life. And you just think about her home life. It's not chaotic. People aren't just running every direction. You know, there's a, there's a clear direction. They know what they're supposed to do. People know what they're going after during the day. She's given them uh, responsibility. She's given them instruction. There is a clear order in the home life. Uh, one commentator says that of, of the Proverbs 31 woman, it says that self-denial is the main principle of her life. Self-denial. That is to say, she is not self-indulgent. You know, she is denying herself for the sake of the, the work in front of her. And I just think about, again, just looking at not just the, the women in the room, but for the men in the room, to think about if you're married, if you're going to encourage your wife toward this kind of labor, toward this kind of lifestyle, to this kind of discipline, you know, that requires the, the men who are to lead the home to be even more disciplined, to work even harder, you know, to, to be an example in those things. So it's not that the, the wife is the, is the only one doing this. There's an implicit here that the husband should be doing these things too. If you're going to lead a wife in this, you have to be doing this. The same way with parenting. You know, to try to help our kids be more self-disciplined. If you try to help your kid, I want, to, I want to help you operate in a schedule. I want to help you be disciplined with your time. Well, that requires us as parents to be more disciplined, right? Us to, to actually follow through on what we ask them to do. Us to get up before them and stay up after them to make sure they've done all their things. So this raises the bar, for husbands. This raises the bar as parents, this kind of disciplined life. In all of this, again, under this banner of her work, just as you watch her life, what does it look like as she works, as she labors, uh, under the, the bigger banner of fear of the Lord? This is what it looks like for a God-fearer to approach daily life with self-discipline, uh, industriousness, uh, just, a, just a work ethic that says, I want to serve the Lord today with whatever I have in front of me. And then uh, as we move into verse 16, you see just the, the next realm, similar to her work. But now you see her, her managing resources. 
different kind of responsibilities. So number two here, the, the faithfulness in her resources. You could say uh, a stewardship. You know, what does she do with the things she has been entrusted with? She starts to, to buy and sell in this section. She starts to make things. She starts to make a profit. And I think overarching is just to think about this in the realm of stewardship. What has she been entrusted with? Whatever has been entrusted to her care, she, she manages well, uh, with thoughtfully, with diligence. Verse 16, it says, She considers a field and buys it. From her earnings, she plants a vineyard. So here, there's a, just a resourcefulness in, in growing the, the assets. Again, of this, you think about just the household estate. All of this, uh, starting from the point of the household, we're going to see throughout. But she is uh, increasing the assets. She's not a detractor from the, the, the assets of the household. She's actually a, a benefit. She, she takes whatever she's been entrusted, the finances that she has, and she actually grows them. She's not looking first to say, how do I spend this on me in my own comfort? But how do I, how do I be a steward of these things? And we say the word stewardship. I mean, think about just biblically, what do we mean by stewardship? We mean to, that God is the, the master. We are stewards. We are not owners. Anything that we have, our time, our abilities, our money, uh, houses, cars, whatever it is that you own, that we are not the ultimate owners. To say God is the owner and we are only stewards, accountable before him. And that's the, the, the life that she puts on display. And here, verse 16, it says she considers a field. Uh, this, this word consideration, she's actually thoughtfully planning. She's not just impulsively buying. She doesn't just see a field and buys it. There's a consideration. There's a disposition of the mind here. She is weighing options. She, she's weighing the cost. She ponders. That is to say, she is pondering. Is this the best way to use the money? Is this the best purchase? You know, she's not frivolous in her spending. She doesn't click the Amazon buy now button. No, I'm kidding. But, you know, she is, she is thoughtful in how she spends, right? She, she takes an account. What is the best way to spend this money? You know, for the benefit of, of the household, for the benefit of others, to maximize whatever she's been entrusted with from the Lord. And then in verse 16, it says, she, from her earnings, she plants a vineyard. So you have a, a progression here in verse 16. She buys a field, and then from her earnings, and the earnings there is really the produce of the field. From the fruit of that field, now she has more, more resources, and now she plants a vineyard, buy, buys more with those resources. So just this progression of she has resources, she, she buys a field, she cultivates it, the produce of that field now is used to, to buy a vineyard, to plant more. So you see the, just the production here growing bigger and bigger. And, and again, the, the emphasis is not that, okay, everyone needs to have a side hustle. You got to see how can, I, you know, how can I, with my extra time, make more money. That's not, the, that's not the emphasis. I think the emphasis is, again, stewardship. What is she doing with the resources that she has? How is she thinking strategically about those resources? Uh, how is she using those? just to maximize the, the benefit to her household. She is a, a net addition here to her family. She's not frivolous. She's not, she's not spending all the money on herself. She is putting it to work. And she doesn't take her duties lightly. You know, whatever she has been entrusted with, she manages diligently throughout this, this passage. You just see whatever she has in front of her, she does it diligently. Uh, Charles Bridges uh, a commentator writes, who can have the claim to a virtuous woman who does not feel this weight of family responsibility? I think that's what's in view here, is just the, the weight of responsibility that she has. So just to consider uh, in your own life, kind of zooming, zooming up a bit, just, just whatever responsibility. Again, a stewardship here. Whatever you have uh, in front of you, you know, whatever, you know, family situation, kids, not kids, married, not married, but what resources, time, job, you know, apartment, house, whatever you have to think about stewarding those things. How are you doing it? Managing those responsibilities. That's the, that's the thrust here, to look at this woman, to look at just a standard of this is what godliness looks like, to, to have this disposition to the resources that God has given. Again, all under the fear of the Lord as a steward of what God has given. 
And you have, to, you have to get this. This is so basic just to the Christian faith to see that we are obligated, we are indebted to God. You know, to understand grace, you have to understand that you are indebted to God. You know, that you have actually not done everything he's asked. You have not obeyed perfectly. You have not stewarded. You've actually rebelled. You haven't kept his law. And he, and he gives grace. He gives mercy Right? The Christianity here is just those that have trusted in God's grace through the person of Jesus Christ. And here, this is a, a woman who understands that, who's experienced God's grace. And now these, these obligations that we have, these are privileges. We get to now serve the king. You know, where before, before you were saved, all of the things that you did, all the resources that you had, all the time that you had was spent for self the service of me. How do I maximize my own pleasure, my own enjoyment? And now as a, a servant of the king, you actually get to, to use your resources and your time to serve him, to serve others. You've been freed from a, a love of self, a service of self. And this is what she puts on display in this passage. A service, a different kind of fulfillment in life. Fulfillment going after God's purposes. And back to the start where it says her husband, in verse 11, trusts in her. Well, you look at her life, well, of course he does. Look how trustworthy she is. Look how trustworthy she is with resources. Look how trustworthy she is with her time. She is faithful in all these things. In verse 17, it says, she girds herself with strength. She makes her arms strong. Uh, girds to put a, on a belt of strength. Her clothing. Again, if you look at her life, what do you see? You see a work ethic. You see a, a joyful service. But you also see strength. There is a, a strength on display. And it's not to say like muscles, like, oh, she has strong arms. But a, a fortitude. You think about all of the, the responsibilities that she has. You know, all these people that she's responsible for. Uh, she has now this vineyard and this field. There's the household responsibilities. All these responsibilities on her. And under all of these responsibilities, what you see is strength. You see fortitude. She doesn't bend under all the pressure. There's a, a resilient, resiliency to her life. She's not a, a quitter. She doesn't throw in the towel when things get hard. You know, we have to, in parenting, over and over again, tell our kids this. You know, when things get hard, this is the opportunity to respond, to see what your character is made of when you're pressed, when things are difficult, when a lot is required of you. And for her, what comes out is strength. Uh, the proverb picks this back up in verse 25, we'll look at next week, but the same thing, strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. This kind of strength in the face of, of the future in that verse, you think in the face of an uncertain future, in the face of anxiety and potential fear, what does she demonstrate? She demonstrates strength. And knowing that this is not a strength that comes from her, under the fear of the Lord, someone who is actually entrusting themselves to the, to the Lord, strengthened in the strength that he supplies. So she is strong in the Lord. And just consider those moments in your life when you're most stressed out, you feel the most pressure. I, I know for me, when I haven't handled those things well, you could look back and I, I could ask the question and say, what was I trusting in? What was I finding my strength in, in those moments? When, when I crumbled under pressure, when I was anxious. You know, for the one here who finds their strength in the Lord, they have now strength to handle whatever situation, whatever pressure comes at them in life. I remember someone, we were talking about our, our youngest daughter. Uh, we'll see if she's paying attention this morning, but our, our youngest daughter talked about when she was little, we said she is, uh, she is our most, most stubborn child and, uh, and our most fearless child. And I was, I was explaining to someone, I was like, man, it's just a, it's a scary combo, right? To be stubborn and fearless. Because she wants to climb, she wants to jump, she doesn't want anyone to help her, not afraid of anything. And it's like, man, she's, gonna, she's really going to hurt herself. And this, it was uh, just this lady in the church said, well, yep, that's all true, but just imagine if the Lord gets a hold of her. Imagine what it would look like for a, a stubborn, fearless woman to go after the, the Lord's purposes. You know, if she is gripped by the gospel of Christ, what would it look like to be stubborn and fearless? You know, stubborn with the truth, unbending uh, in the face of adversity. You know, fearless with the gospel. What might that look like in a life? 
Uh, that's, I think that's what's in view here, the strength that this woman has, uh, a stubbornness, unflinching, a, a life of conviction, you know, unflinching with the truth, stubborn for the sake of Christ. That's the kind of uh, daughters we want to raise. That's the kind of women we want to encourage in the truth, is strong women, strong with the truth, strong with conviction, you know, unbending in the face of adversity, unbending in a culture that says, go after this and go after this, and this is where your purpose is. To have women that say, no, my, my purpose is found in what God says. My purpose is found in the, in the truth of Scripture. My purpose is found following after Christ. We want to have women that are, that are fearless in that sense, that are strong in the Lord. That's the, the kind of strength here. A woman of, of conviction, a woman of fortitude. Verse 18 goes on to say, She senses that her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out at night. So we've seen her already uh, get up early. Well, now it says that her lamp does not go out at night. So she, is, uh, she has a candlelight as she's working late. She stays up late. And again, this is a, just to remind us, this is a kind of a holistic picture, looking at her life over seasons of time. So it's not to say that every day she's up before the sun rises and every night she goes to bed at midnight. But, but, it's, but what's, what's going on here is she, she is not going to bed if she still has work to do. You know, she's not taking the easy way out. She's willing to expend herself late into the night to, to go after these responsibilities in this realm of stewardship. Okay, I have a responsibility. I have to stay up late. I may have to expend myself. I may have to work harder. It's interesting, you talk about parents. I was talking to a parent of a, of a new baby uh, just this weekend, and they're talking about, you know, the, the late nights, sleepless nights. The baby finally got six hours of sleep. And it's like, I, and I remember those days, and it's, you know, late nights. But then, then you talk to parents of teenagers, and they talk about the late nights. Man, we're now we're staying up late, having conversations, late into the night to, to, to talk through life, all these conversations. You think about just that, that kind of stewardship for a mother to say, I'm willing to stay up late. I'm still willing to stay up late with a newborn, willing to stay up late with a teenager, willing to do whatever it takes to, to manage whatever's in front of me well, to go after these responsibilities. And it says here that she, uh, she senses, verse 18, she senses that her gain is good. This word senses also to taste. She tastes, you can say, the fruit of her labor. Uh, Psalm 34, 9, taste and see that the Lord is good. So she experiences it. She experiences that, that her gain, the profit from her labor is good. You know, the benefit of a job well done. I know, I know we've all, we all can remember times, hopefully uh, regular times, where you go to bed tired at night because you worked hard. You know, just that God-given fulfillment of saying, I, I worked hard today, I expended myself, I'm tired. And there's just a gift from the Lord to be able to enjoy your labor in that way, the book of Ecclesiastes talks about. So here, she, she feels this uh, accomplishment. She senses that it is good to expend herself in this way. So she goes to bed tired at night, but she is enjoying the fruit of her labor just the, the benefit of a, a job well done. And you see here, not an entitlement mindset. She's not, she's not going to bed saying, what about me? I didn't get what I wanted today. I worked so hard and now I have to stay up late? Do I have to keep working? No, she, she actually sees that this is good. She senses this is good. She tastes it. She experiences, oh yes, this is, this is what I must do. You see uh, just a thankfulness, a contentedness on display here. Not asking the question, what's in it for me? But, uh, but an appreciation even. Appreciation because she isn't doing it for herself. A thankfulness. Again, in the Lord's service. A gratefulness. You know, whenever we're self-centered, that is when we, we complain. That is when our work becomes laborious. That is when we're, uh, we're ungrateful and entitled. But here you see the, the other-centeredness. Focus on others. You're going to see throughout in the next verse. She, she is so focused on others. She is not concerned about her. And that's where her, her joy is found, in the service of the Lord and the service of others. And just consider the, the kind of example this would put, this, put on display in, in the home life. To see, a, to see a mom that is just thankfully, gratefully serving, working long into the night with joy. 
for her kids to see that, for, the, for her kids to see, man, mom is such a hard worker, and she does it so joyfully. Imagine what, what that would produce in the next generation of kids to see that from their mom, to have their consciences informed. Oh, that's what it looks like to joyfully serve the Lord. In verse 19, it says, She stretches out her hands to the distaff, and her hands grasp the spindle. Uh, distaff, spindle, these are, are terms for a, a sewing machine. The distaff would have been like a wheel, kind of the old-fashioned, uh, kind of like a rocking horse-style sewing machine. You have a wheel, you have a spindle. Uh, our son, uh, for Christmas, got a, a 3D printer, and uh, he's been every, every day printing. But it's this, you know, I don't even know how 3D printers work, but there's basically this roll, a spool of plastic that goes through and melts and then prints these, whatever object you put in. But here, it's the, this is the, the spool. And what's on the spool here is, the, is what she collected. Remember, she collected wool. She collected flax. So now she is using those things. Now she has the, the spindle. The wool is on the spindle. She is now making clothes. So she is kind of the end of this section, really, verse 13 through 19. It started with her collecting the resources. Now she is putting them to use. And she works with her hands. This is not uh, beneath her, this manual labor. Start to finish, she has completed this task. And I think what's, what's impressive here is you think about just in the flow here, verse 15, it says that she has given food to her household in portions. She has given assignments to her maidens. She has delegated responsibility. But here she is not uh, afraid to do the hard work, to do the manual labor. You know, she's not sitting on the couch and just pointing out instructions. She is, she is getting after it. She's being an example of work. She is an example of diligence. She demonstrates a work ethic here. She is continually working with her hands. She gets dirty. You know, she has calluses on her hands. Her hands grasp the spindle with her own hands doing this work. And uh, as, you, as you keep reading, I think the next verse, it's, I think is, is a little bit almost shocking if you think about just the, the expectation of, of all of this work that she has done, all of this labor. She has worked so hard. She has gotten up early. She has stayed up late. You know, she has just labored night after night, day after day, working with her own hands. And then in verse 20, you see that the, the poor, the needy come to her. And after all this work, she is not thinking about, you know, herself. Man, I worked so hard for this. I labored so hard. She is eager to be generous. Look at verse 20. She extends her hand to the poor. And she stretches out her hands to the needy. She is just quick to be generous. Her impulse is to be generous to those who ask. After she's done all this work, clearly she wasn't doing this work for herself. She wasn't doing the work so that now she could just relax. She was, she was always laboring for others. So when someone asks for help, she is eager to step in. She, she is not concerned about herself. She is just eager to give. And I remember the first, uh, just the first kind of real job that I had where you're clocking in and out in high school. And uh, I don't, minimum wage now is like $28 an hour or something crazy, but it was like, you know, $6 or something. And, uh, and you feel that, right? I mean, you're working all these hours. You can count the number of hours for the small paycheck. And, uh, and, I, and I was just thinking about this passage and the, you know, the temptation. You're like, I've worked all those hours. I've spent all that time. I remember all the pain. And now, you're, now if someone else would want something from me, you want me to be generous? You want me to give to others all this stuff that I earned? And that's the disposition here. She, she is eager to give. She is generous. And it's so easy to be, especially as you think about just the busyness of life, uh, household responsibilities, all these things that come at you, to, to just be self-focused, even just to, to have your, your, your eyes down on, here's all the work that I have, here's all the things that I have in front of me, but she has her eyes up, ready to step into the lives of others as she works hard, as she labors, not fixated on self, but just to consider it. I mean, just think about that just in the workplace in general, a Christian in the workplace, to be that kind of worker that is, that is so uh, industrious, such a hard worker, but, but actually at the same time have your, have your eyes up to how do I serve others? How do I help others? How do I step into those in need? That is what she demonstrates. 
uh, this relationship now, this is the, the third point, is, is her faithfulness in her relationships, how, she's, how she views others. And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to stop there. We're going we're gonna to pick up the rest next week and work through the rest of this chapter. But just, uh, it's such a good chapter, but just to put in front of you, I think what, what I love about, again, about this passage is, is you look at just a, really a standard to put in front of us of this is what godliness looks like. Biblical femininity, a uh, godly woman, you know, for all of us to embrace this. For the, the dads in the room to embrace, this is what I want to train my daughters toward, what I want to encourage. This is what I want to lead my wife toward. For the, the women in the room to say, this is what I want to go after. You know, and some of us in this room might be encouraged and say, man, I see the Lord working in this. And some of you might feel conviction. You know, if you see God, this is what God is, is putting forward. And you look at your own life and you say, man, there are, there are weaknesses. There might even be sin. There might be selfishness that's prevent me from that. I mean, this is the, the nature of, of having the Holy Spirit if you are in Christ, that you see God's word and that if you're not, your life is not lining up, that you have conviction over sin, you know, guilt, to, to, to embrace that, to lower yourself under what God says, to repent of those things and to also to know that if you have God's spirit, you actually have the divine enablement to obey. You have the divine power to actually go after these things. But this is, this is not just God saying, here's a standard that's unattainable, but God actually giving you, uh, giving you strength to actually go in this direction if you are in Christ. So let me, uh, let me close our time in prayer and just pray that God would, would move us in this direction to see these things, what God says is pleasing to him for a woman and that, that this room would be marked by these things. God, we just thank you for the clarity of your word. I thank you just for the, just the, the picture that you give us of a godly woman. I just think about all the, the women in this room, the young women, the, the single ladies, the married women, the older saints, Lord, that, that all of them would go after these virtues, not because of a benefit to themselves, but because this is what you require. This is what you say is pleasing in your sight, that we would be a, a church that is marked by a fear, a right fear of you. And in that fear, a desire to please you, a love for you that leads us to want to to please you, to lead, lead lives that are in humble worship, submitted under your truth. Uh, we love you, Lord. We pray these things in your name. Amen.